Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before, this is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network. Eastern time. Uh, a little bit later, we'll have a, a citizens panel. But uh, this week, uh, we're running three interviews that we did, and this is interview number one that we did with our uh, good friend Jack Garfine, who, uh, as you may well know, uh, is uh, was a movie director and uh, stage uh, the director, member of the Actors Studio. Uh, I could go on and on, and these are some of the tales now. We, we, we followed him in our first set of interviews when he was in a concentration camp, or 11 of them, actually. And now we followed him to the United States where he's getting into the theater, and we find out more about his life in America. Here's that uh, second interview of three that we have in the can with Jack Garfine. And we're back with Jack Garfine. So you, you have this... Um, school that you're going to, the yeah. School of Dramatic Arts, it's called? What, dramatic Workshop. The D Dramatic Workshop. And you pay for the second year, okay, yeah. and you're on your way. Now, how did you get from that to your full Broadway directing and your time at the actor's studio? Well, also when I was in school, I had a job as an usher at the lowest theater, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, and, and, uh, and as a package boy. Yeah. First uh, at the Beacon Hotel, mm -hmm. which is still there. Right. right. I had a job as a, as a package boy, any packages that came in. Yeah, right. And I loved it because I was sitting there for hours. I read Shakespeare, Bacon, every, you know, all the great writers. But one day the head usher, <laughs> came in and he saw me reading Shakespeare. What? Don't tell me you're an actor. You told me you were interested in accounting and you want to be an accountant. And he fired me. <laughs> he, didn't, <laughs> he didn't want actors to have a job. Uh, so anyway, so I was out of a job, but then I got the usher's job. And the head guy there tried to discourage me from being an actor. Yeah. Every, everybody, nobody wants you to be an actor. They're all, they're right? all nobody, nobody wants you to be an actor. Everybody's trying to discourage you from being no, an yeah, actor. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. you were single purpose. You knew exactly what you except wanted. Except Piscata. Yeah. Said you were a great director. Well, he gave me the scholarship. I'm sure if I had gone back for the second year, he would have done it again, you know. Yeah. Uh, what's his name? Uh, you know, the actor who was in the Billy Wilder movie with Marilyn Monroe. Uh, 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 his original name was Bernie Schwartz. Oh, oh, you mean Tony Curtis. What? Tony Curtis. Yeah. Yeah. So Tony Curtis was invited to Berlin yeah. to deliver the eulogy or for Piscata when he died. Mm -hmm. So he talked about the influence of what Piscata did. But he said, but I'm telling you something. The memory that stays with me all the time is when I saw this gray-haired man in his late 60s walking down 48th Street right. with his arm around the boy, 18, who had gone through 11 camps. Yeah. So did you get a second year scholarship to the school? I didn't need to uh, because of the screening. Joe Wollhand let her rain. Oh, okay, so you got the money to do yeah. the second year. Yeah, yeah. So when did you break away from there? And, and Well, I graduated, mm -hmm. right? They misspelled my name on the graduation. <laughs> it's Garfine instead of Garfine. <laughs> okay. yeah. And um, what happened was that uh, I got a job as a package boy, usher, all that. Yeah. And um, then a guy who was with me Oh yeah, then the American Theater Wing. Yeah, I uh, 
uh, I got, but oh, I know a very important story. Okay. Yeah. So what happened was, Strasbourg was organizing. Now, this is this is Lee Strasberg. Yeah. Uh, of the uh, uh, of, of the actors' studio. It was, he wasn't yet in the It wasn't yet the actor's studio. It, but. Actor's studio was there, but he wasn't a part of it. Right. And um, he said he was organizing a class at the American Theater Wing mm -hmm. for directing. That 20, maybe 25, no, I think it was 30 people could apply and, uh, and do their, show him their scenes. And after that, he would organize the first directing class in New York mm -hmm. with 10 people, okay? Right. So I had done scenes with actors. I went and I did, uh, can't think of the title of the book now, uh, a scene from book mm -hmm. and, and I did it. And then when the term was over, he was gonna choose 10 people. Most were GIs, the, the GI Bill right. was paying for <clears throat> Right. And uh, I was again on a scholarship, you know? Yeah. So um, after I did my scene with the other actors, I didn't hear anything. So I thought, okay, fuck. So my friend said, call them up and find out, you know? And so, uh, and then he, uh, he was already, that's when he, the year he became a kind of a teacher at the actor studio, and I wasn't a founder, you know. Yeah. So, uh, what happened was, uh, I got to the actor studio, and I now, saw- Now, let me just say to people, so they, they know, because a lot of people don't know this. Yeah. The actor studio at that time became almost the focal point yeah. for well, all the big the actors actor of the time. was founded by Kazan, Yeah. Danny Mann, Ilya Kazan, and Cheryl Crawford. Yeah, and the idea was, you didn't have to pay any fees. That what he said, Kazan said, I wanted it to be a place where the actors got out of the rain. <laughs> right? And it's true because outside, like today, yeah, they're being cast for type for this, not as artists and not as people who can make a contribution. Right, and so and he wanted a place for that to be. And so uh, when I went to see him, oh no, excuse me. So the class at the American Theater Wing was over. My friends asked me to call, I didn't hear anything. Call, find out. So uh, I had the courage finally and, and I called mm -hmm. and I said, uh, I just want, I haven't heard, I just wanna know if I passed, uh, my name is Jack Garfine. Yes, Mr. Garfine, you passed. So when does the directing class start? It doesn't start, Mr. Garfine. You're the only one that passed. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. And so then, then uh, how did you get to the actor's studio? So what happened was I then went to see Strasbourg when he became part of the actor's ah, studio. Ah, okay. A couple right. of years later. Yeah. And I, I said, uh, what about, I'd like to also be a part of it. He said, Jack, you have to direct the production. And after you direct the production, mm -hmm. we'll come and see it and then become part of the actor's studio. So what happened was a guy who was in my class at the theater wing yeah. became a director at NBC on the Kate Smith show. And they decided to do dramatic segments with all the exciting young actors. And, uh, and so he, uh, he again uh, recommended me to, to direct, you know. I, oh, I was, that's when I had my job as, um, as a package boy. As a package boy. Yeah. And now they want you so to direct, again, wait a minute, no, let me no, get no, the, let me. No, what happened no. was, is he said, called me up and he said, uh, Jack, uh, I talked about you to the producer, to Barry Wood, mm -hmm. and uh, do you think you could do the scene that you did there at this 
place. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, because, oh, because what I did was to, to get attention and money, all the actors were in their 40s, their 30s. Yeah. I was the director, right? <laughs> so they, uh, I said that if they wanted, me, I could do a scene at a party when I had guests, I would ask the actors to do it. Yeah. And the actors first thought I was nuts. I said, well, listen, we're not going to get paid, but we're going to eat well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we did. And, and then they asked me to do a scene. And after that, people came to me and said, could you do it at my party? And they paid some money. And the actors were amazed, right? And so he got Barry Wood to see it. And he asked, Barry Wood asked me, would I bring it in to the studio where he yeah. would see it? But first he wanted to talk to me. Yeah. So I came in and talked to him. He said to me, um, so uh, how did you, I said, how I got the actors. I told him how I worked with them. And he said, well, okay, so I want you to do this on the audition night when they do Kate Smith show. They had acrobats, jugglers, you know. Oh, oh, the book is Darkness at Noon. Yeah. About the communist regime. Right. Yeah. And I'm there, and they ask me, what are you doing? I said, Darkness at Noon. How, what do you mean? What happens? The lights go out at noon, you know, because this wasn't a dramatic show, you know. Right. And so I did Darkness at Noon and the scene, and I was asked to come in and see Barry Wood. So I thought, okay, he's going to give me a job as an assistant. I'm a kid. He's going to give me a job as a assistant stage manager or coffee boy. I, so I ignored it. Two weeks later, the secretary calls me and says, Mr. Garfield, we don't understand. Why don't you want to come in and see Mr. Wood? Oh, I'm sorry, I lied. I said, I was busy, I'm working, <laughs> you know. Okay, so she gave me a date. So I went to see Barry Wood. And uh, I felt, uh, okay, I see, but I know nothing's going to come of it. You don't want to be a male boy. Yeah. And Barry Wood said, said to me, listen, I'm very impressed with what you did. Let me ask you something. Do you think you could direct uh, small segments on a television show? And of course, I never even got near a television show. Right. Of course, I said, I can direct it. He said, well, the idea is, all the young actors on Broadway, Barry Nelson, Phyllis Love, Donald Buca, who were, you know, big coming up. Mm -hmm. I'd like to do a series with them. Do you think you could handle it? Sure. I said, no problem. <laughs> so he said, okay, go ahead and talk to the manager, the, you know, produce, not the producer, but the manager of the mm -hmm. So I go in and the guy says to me, oh, Mr. Wood is very impressed with you. So it's a weekly show, mm -hmm. you, but every two weeks, so you have a week to prepare it right. and then you can do it. Now when you say directing, uh, were you literally directing the show? In other words, were you calling the camera shots yeah, and everything? everything. So you were becoming a full-fledged yeah, television no, I producer. I worked with the script. I worked yeah. with the script and then I... The setting, uh, I directed it. Yeah, yeah. So he said to me, uh, the manager said, so what about, you have an agent? I said, no, no, I don't have an agent. So what, uh, what would it cost to have you work for us to do a show? Well, I was making $35 a week mm -hmm. at the hotel. Yeah. So I thought, well, what about $70 a week? Oh, boy. <laughs> the guy said, seventy dollars a week. Okay, you got the job. <laughs> he probably was saving several hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, what happened was that uh, I did the first show with Donald Buca. Mm -hmm. A critic in the Daily News said, "I have not seen acting like this since the poetic realism of the group theater." Mm, wow. You know, and so I said, oh, great for me. Now I can go to see Strasbourg. <laughs> I mean, who yeah. the hell ever got a review like that? Exactly. So I went to the actor's studio, waited until they broke, and he came out and said, 
sorry to disturb you, Mr. Strasberg, but I need to talk. Oh, how are you? I said, I'm okay. I said, well, look, I directed this show. I want you to see the review. This is what the critic said. And Strasberg looked and said, oh, very nice. well, Jack, to be a member of the actor's studio, we are not all actors, there were no directors, only actors. As a director, you have to do a show in a small theater somewhere with professional actors. Well, you already work with professional, I mean, with actors. And then I'll come and see it. And so I said, okay. So I was submitted a show to Equity Library Theater, but they weren't too crazy about it, but they had a problem with the production that they did want to do called mm -hmm. Camille, based on the book. Right. And uh, they said that they, they had a difficulty with that, and uh, uh, it's not cast yet, so it's open. Uh, would you be interested in doing that? And I said, well, I have to reread it, but yes, I'm interested. I want to do it. Mm -hmm. so don't worry about it, because I felt it. Yeah. What a chance. This is your audition for Strasbourg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, so I cast it and got a, a great designer, very famous. He's still working. Um, he did Tias of the August Moon. Uh, and so Peter, Peter uh, Larkin. Mm -hmm. And so uh, and so, what happened was uh, I cast it well and mm -hmm. rehearsed it, did what, things with it. And so now came opening night, I invited Strasbourg. Yeah. And Strasbourg shows up with John Gassner. Remember Who's John Gassner? No, I don't. don't. The editor of, of plays, books on plays, uh -huh. and a, also a lecturer on the mm -hmm. theater. Mm -hmm. Very important in those yeah. days. And uh, I put myself in a position in the theater where I could watch their reactions, right? Mm -hmm. And what, I was all of 19 then, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I watched, and then during the intermission I, I I started to walk out when Strasbourg is looking for me. Yeah. So I I go up and I think, oh why he said, uh, okay uh, we'll talk about it sometime and see. And then he left with Gassner after the first act. Or se after the second act maybe. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, fuck the actor studio. It's another a failure. Okay? Right. So uh, I never heard anything from Strasbourg studio. And again, like it happened with this thing, my friends urged me to call. Yeah, give them a call. I didn't have the nerve, but finally I called. And I said, excuse me, uh, my name is Jack Garfer. Mr. Garfer, we don't have a number. We can't call you anyway. Oh. I said, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Strasberg said you can attend the actor's studio. Wow. Now, there you are, you're at the end. Oh, no, then yeah. a revolution with, my, with the acting. Oh, boy. Because what happened was they had scenes that they did, but they never did a production. Nothing came out of the studio except individual actors who would be cast and people would say, wow, particularly in Kazan's productions. Yeah. Okay? Oh, and I had this incident with Kazan. So what happened was uh, I went and I found a play because everyone rejected it. And I happened to be invited by this uh, photographer. And they, at that time, uh, stereos, hi-fi just came out. Yeah, right. And he had a great hi-fi, so you could hear the music, like couldn't hear it. Right. And I, I was, you know, so I would go for those evenings. Mm -hmm. And one evening, I met uh, Calder Willingham. Right, great and, playwright. Uh, he told me that he wrote this play. Everybody turned it down. Nobody wants to do it. So I said, Well, could I ha read it? And he said, Yes, under one condition: don't call me unless you're doing. A, I have a production. But I don't want to have conferences, meetings about the script. That's from, I've been going through all this. I don't want that. Just let me read it, okay? 
So I went and tried to cast it. And of course, they are not, no, none of all the actors. Eli Wallach. Now, who are some of the actors that the actors do? What? When you were going to the actors' yeah. studio in the beginning, who were some of the actors who were there? I, I, a lot of them, I forget the name. Um, Walter Matthau. Uh, uh, Brando was no longer there. He would come once in a while yeah. just to watch. Uh, Annie Jackson. Um, almost all really big who became who were big stars later you know yeah I can't think of all the names right now I think I'll, right and um, Mike Gazzo you Mike know, Gazzo yeah, who was uh, like hat full of rain yeah and yeah. yeah but what happened was that I would go up to these actors saying I'm going to do a play I'd like you to cast you in the name this kid's gonna do a play, and I'm gonna be like, eh. there was nothing to do with me. So I went to all the young actors who just came in that nobody was interested in. Yeah. James Dean, uh, <laughs> uh, Ben Gazzara, George, not George Pepper, Ben Gazzara, um, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, uh, it'll come to me. Uh, yeah, I have the same problem. So uh, they, they uh, I went to them, and, and I got them together at a meeting. All, all these well, you were the first person. You said you actually kind of discovered James Dean, that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. this was the first thing he had yeah, ever yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, I got them all together, mm -hmm. and I said, now look, I want to work on this play, but I'm not going to do it equity way. Three weeks of rehearsal, or you have dates, you can't make it. I'm sorry. You're going to have to work with me every time, and I'll only show it when I feel it's ready. Show it. Nobody shows anything in the actor's studio, any full plays. They do scenes. People are going to kill us. I said, I don't care. Then not a part of it. But I'm going to do something that's never been done, okay? I want to do a production developed at the actor's studio and done for actor's studio members with Strasbourg people there like that. And uh, finally, they all agreed. I said, well, when are we gonna do it? I know you have jobs. Some of you may even get parts in a place somewhere mm -hmm. or an extra, or whatever. Right. So we're gonna rehearse in the evening. So it'll be from about nine o'clock until midnight or 11.30 or 8.30, I said. Yeah, you know. right. And uh, they all agreed. He said, fine, we'll do it, Jack. And I told them what parts, cast, and we had the first reading, and they got very excited by the way I talked to them, what I said. So then, uh, one night, we were rehearsing on the seventh floor of the Anta building, and New York wasn't as dangerous then as it is today, but still, 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. yeah. So I may always make sure the doors were locked and safe. So one night, as we're rehearsing, guess what? What? We hear footsteps coming up the stairs. Oh, Pat Hengel was one of the people. Mm -hmm. another, All of them another great actor. First at the acting time. job. Really? Oh, yeah. Pat Hingle, Pat Hingle, in case people don't know, was a very, very accomplished actor. And if I, well, if the I, first time Kazan saw him, and, and people have seen him, but they one of the he's one of those people that they go, wasn't he that guy that was in that thing, you know? But anyway, so go ahead. So we hear footsteps. Pat was the last one to come in. We said, "What the fuck? You didn't lock the door." I did. I made sure. Come on, nobody else has a key to come in at this hour. What the fuck? Steps closer. Jimmy Dean grabs a chair, right? Yeah. Ben Gazzaro grabs another one, right? <laughs> and they get to either side. We're quiet. Yeah. The door opens. It's Ilya Kazan. <laughs> so he says, what, what are you guys doing here? So I introduce myself as a director. I said that. My name is Jack, I'm a director. And he, he looked at me like this kid. This kid know, is a director. director. Yeah. And, I, and he said, 
So what, what are you doing here? And I explained that most of us have jobs during the day. I'm, I'm working at Lois Theatres, all that. But we meet at night, there's a project that I'm working on that I'm, I'm rehearsing every night, you know. Mm -hmm. And Kazan said, and you walk up seven flights every night, yeah. Every night, he said. Well, all I can say to you, and I introduced Pat Hengel, James mm -hmm. Dean, everybody, he didn't know anybody. And he looked and he said, all I can say is, you come and rehearse every night and you walk up seven flights, I'm gonna predict something. Each one of you are gonna make an important contribution to film and the theater. And with that, let's leave it yeah, right let's there. Leave it and right. we'll come back yeah, yeah, and yeah. talk some more. But you got a lot of stuff nobody else got. With Jack Garfine. Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before, this is Gavin, the Great American Broadcast Network. And that was our uh, second interview of, uh, well, actually, it's our uh, more than second, actually. It's actually our fifth interview with Jack Garfine, but it's the second of this uh, series. And if you're, I, I know, I've got to say this, uh, to be very honest, it, 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 some of it is very difficult to, to follow uh, because Jack is very old. He's quite old. He's 88 years old. And um, he is giving you his remembrances of what went on back then. And uh, he, he doesn't have it, you know, where I would do something in somewhat a linear way if I were telling a story. Uh, there is no linear quality to this with Jack because at this point he is simply telling the story as he remembers it and as he knows it and um, uh, we're, 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 we're having a you know we're having a nice little talk but you've got to follow it now if you have followed it or whether if you haven't followed it for the last couple of nights uh, tomorrow night the final episode of this uh, series of interviews I did with Jack is absolutely fascinating. It has to do with uh, his, uh, his time with James Dean, with Marilyn Monroe, who was, he was very close to, and uh, stories about them and about his uh, being the last person to see James Dean alive, okay? Uh, but that'll be tomorrow night, and I, I, I tell you, you should not miss it, okay? It is worth uh, listening to. Uh, boy, uh, I, uh, I, tonight is a feel-free night, which is a, a good deal for a lot of you people out there because uh, it simply means that uh, uh, you can get a word in edgewise. No, he's been very good lately. Uh, but uh, you, you might want to give us a call and be part of our citizen panel. And uh, our, uh, the lines are open right now. And if you don't know how to get on the citizen panel, just go over to gabnet.net and over on the right-hand side of the page is everything you need to know about getting on the citizen panel. Uh, how to get Skype, how to use Skype, how to call us on Skype, all of those things. And by the way, by the way, while you're there, if you feel that in going over there you're going to miss some of this program, the video is playing over there too, live. So uh, just go right over there. And anytime we're on here live, uh, you can go there to see the, uh, the video as well and blow it up to your full page or whatever. Anyway, and as you can see, this camera is a uh, 4K camera we're using here. We're not putting it out in 4K. It's going out in what's called 720p, but it's capable. It, you can see how clear it is. If, if it weren't, could I do this? Okay, anyway. Hmm. So I'm going to sit here and wait for people to start calling and uh, hope that you all join us. Uh, Marjorie is getting better by inches. Uh, and uh, today she was better than she was yesterday. In fact, she's about 100% better than she was yesterday. Uh, she's walking with a cane, but she's walking straight. I even saw her walking a little bit without the cane. So it's, it's getting better. It's not great, but it's better. And I figure that by the time we have to get her to the doctor next uh, Monday, uh, it's going to be interesting 
and easy to do because I think she can get in and out of a cab pretty well by then. But she's, she's in better shape. She's in better shape. Me, I'm not so much. You know, I've been taking these pills, these gabapentin pills, for my foot numbness. And all it's supposed to do is to do away with the pain of the foot numbness. Well, I take them at night, and it puts me to sleep. And uh, I wake up, and I'm just absolutely loopy all day. Uh, but the one thing it has done is I'm much nicer to Marjorie. She says, I am just an absolute lovable gem on this pill. So now I'm afraid not to use it, even though I know that if I use it, I'm going to be loopy. Like right now, I'm kind of loopy. I have to figure out a little more all the various things I have to do to get this program uh, going. So um, I'm just hoping that you will all start calling me and we will get a citizens panel going tonight. And I can just sit back and not have to do anything. Um uh, I watched the, uh, uh, I, and I know a lot of you probably did too, uh, and if you didn't, you really missed something. I, you know, they had the funeral today for uh, the service in the National Cathedral for uh, George Bush Sr. Uh, and uh, under normal conditions, I would find something like this absolutely boring and dull, and usually they are. But this wasn't. This was one of the best if there's such a thing as a good funeral, this was a great funeral. And uh, certainly if anybody wanted to do the man justice, uh, they did it very well uh, today. Uh, it was uh, awe-inspiring. Uh, the speeches were wonderful. The remembrances of the man were terrific. Uh, um, and uh, it, was, uh, it was just uh, a... a, a, a a delight in many respects. But also, it was a delight to see how uncomfortable Donald Trump looked throughout the whole thing. Um, he was sitting right next to Obama, who is he's bashed constantly, and he's like two seats down from the Clintons, and they, Hillary wouldn't even look at him, wouldn't even get the, make eye contact. Uh, and, you know, Michelle has said she will never forgive Donald Trump for his birther stuff. So this was a bunch of people who didn't like the guy sitting down at the end of the row. But uh, in any event, he was at the end of the row and uh, they were giving him they were giving him uh, dirty looks. They were giving him dirty looks. And in fact, Cheney was behind him and Cheney was giving him dirty looks. I mean, it was just amazing. So anyway. Uh, it was it was something to watch. Though the music was terrific, the the, the eulogies were uh, superb. Uh, George Bush Jr., who I you know never had any great amount of respect for, gained mine today because you saw a very human side of him, and it was really one of the best eulogies I've ever seen done. I mean, a lot of people got up there. Al, Alan Stimson, uh, Simpson, uh, Stimson, Stimson. Uh, anyway. Uh, and and uh, um, uh, I'm trying to remember some of his other friends who got up and said stuff about him, and they were all terrific, and and the remembrances were wonderful. And then George got up and gave his eulogy, and you'd figure, well, how's he going to top them? And just gave this speech that, you know, in a funeral service, you normally don't hear applause. And you just hear silence and reverence and so on. At the end of his speech, there was applause. There was a large applause, a very heavy applause, and, and a good applause as well. Well, I'm going to give this about another three minutes, and then I'm just going to shut the whole thing down for tonight if I don't start getting some calls. And my lines, the lines are open. What, what is it? Is there something else going on tonight? somewhere because the amount of people watching is very low and uh so i don't uh, uh i don't know where you people are or aren't well here comes jeff stein uh so we'll uh, we'll take a call from jeff and uh see how he's doing hello jeff how are you good yeah good. yeah did you watch hey, the, I, huh? I watched that show show today, this show the <laughs> show show, <laughs> show. yeah <it> was, <laughs> It was a spectacular. It, 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 didn't you find it really good? I found some a lot of it. I agree. I agreed with you. 
uh, it it still took too much time. I mean, it was so slow. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I mean, part of it is that the military strategy, the way they handle this thing where, you know, they take this short step and then everybody moves one step. You're talking about the, yeah. What I said was the girlfriend who's, you know, on crutches and, and has a hard time moving that she could probably get down that aisle faster than they did. Yes. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, but the the speakers were really pretty good. I yeah, mean, who, who was it? St- is his name St- Stimson, right? Simpson? Alan Simpson. Yeah, from... Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Rob. He's from uh, Wyoming? Yeah. Right? yeah. He had a great line. He said... He was uh, He, he was said great. that he, that uh, the... Uh, the thing with George Bush is he always took the high road in Washington, which in Washington has no traffic. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, you know, and I mean, they all told loving stories and funny stories about him. And it was wonderful. But what I what I thought about this was, is his death much more bemoaned and much more... Uh, eulogized because of the current president and the atmosphere he has created and is not the death of of George Bush being used as kind of a, um, uh, uh, what can we call it, an excuse to bash Trump silently? I I, I don't know about bashing Trump, but I I definitely feel... A, a, a more of a sense of loss of another bit of like the rock, the rock that was the White House, the rock that was, you know, when you used to hear the White House says you were like, that's right. The White House says whether you really agreed with the politics of right. the person in there or not. Now you're a suspect to think the White House is actually out to get us. It's a, it's a loss of, of normalcy. It's like, it, it, I don't know. It's a loss it's of respect. Way. It's a loss of respect for the presidency. Yeah, and 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 not trusting your own government anymore. I mean, we always said, "Wow, corrupt politicians." But now, I'm wondering if, with all, with in light of all of the things that have come out recently, and now that I've heard that they subpoenaed Trump, uh, Trump uh, Industries or whatever the hell the name of his company is, yeah, they subpoenaed financial records from from the Trump uh, organization. Mm-hmm. So you know, you, you wonder. Does this president have America's best interests at heart? I never really ever stopped to think that a president didn't, even if you didn't agree with his politics. Okay, let me ask you a question. Let's say that they find great improprieties in the way he ran his company. All right? Let's just say that. Uh, Is that reason to throw him out of office? Because that did happen before he was president. Yeah, it's not. You know. I mean, you can get him on all that stuff, You're gonna, but you're going to have to wait till he's no longer president to get him on that stuff. So what you'd like to hope is that that stuff all becomes public and that it'll destroy his chances of running for a second term. Yeah. yeah. I think that's really all. That's the best you got. That's the best you can hope for. I mean, last night we had Bree say that he didn't think there was any way uh, that uh, Trump was going to get impeached. And, uh, you know, I pretty much have viewed to that, that argument, too. Not so much... Uh, that he can't be impeached, and there isn't a reason to impeach him, but that if we started impeaching him right now, it takes so long that he would no longer be in office by the yeah. time that we finally impeach him. Look how long it's the it t- process of impeaching someone mm-hmm. and going through the whole thing. It's 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 almost it's set up to fail. Well, it's how long? And it, as it should be. Yeah, it's a very, very difficult thing. As it should be. It shouldn't be something that should be easy to do. It shouldn't be easy to impeach a president. You you know something. anybody out. Yeah, but the thing is, uh, it should be a little faster for this reason. If the guy has committed high uh, crimes and misdemeanors, you know, something that is absolutely dangerous to the public and put the public in danger, it would be nice if you could get them out faster. You know, well, so that 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 changes the rules then, because impeachment is not a legal thing. It's a it's a political. Well, impeachment is only the indictment. Right. To begin with. But again, it's all political because it's tried in the Senate. They're not 
they're not like uh, they're not legal crimes. You know, they're not published punishable by by you know the law. They're punishable by the the, the government. So it's a little different, right? If, yeah. if, well, if he's just, found out, if he's found out to have done criminal activity, criminal activity, right? Mm-hmm. Now, not government criminal activity, but criminal activity that he should go to prison for. It seems kind of weird to me that just because he's a president, we can't prosecute him because this man is making decisions in foreign policy, mm-hmm. in trade. In justices, he's shaping this country, and he he could be a convicted felon. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, to me, that's odd that w- there's nothing that we could do about that. You have to wait until he's finished his term. Really? Yeah. I mean that that seems wrong to me. That now cr- now that's not that I'm not talking political crap. Political is political. But if they find out that he is guilty of some serious <clears throat> legal issues there should be a, a quicker avenue well, to you say see, you know what you're yeah. not fit to be president you're a, a felon or at least a, you're a you're a uh, he should be able to stand trial right away and then you know what there should be something in the government that says as much as i hate to say this you know that maybe the vice president needs to take over while you're while you're sorting out your legal issues well the thing that Bree said last night was there was no way they would get to him and i after i thought about it it turns out that Cohn has not just been testifying about stuff that happened in Trump Tower. He's also testifying about stuff that happens with the Trump Foundation and everything else, and that's all been turned over to the state of New York. It could be that Cohn knows where all the bodies are buried, that's and he fear. is screaming like a little banshee, you know? Right. Uh, and and I think that is what Trump is really worried the most about. And I don't know that he even worries about it. I really do believe he thinks he'll come out of this because he's Trump. I can't imagine, though, that he doesn't go to put his head down the pillow every night and worry about this. You know, that I don't think you know, he thinks he's invincible. You don't think so? He uh, made that statement about killing somebody on Fifth Avenue and getting away with it. Well, he was talking about his own cult of personality. He wasn't talking about the fact that as president he could kill somebody and get away with it. Although he probably could. <laughs> I tell you what, he's done pretty much anything else that, you know, how many times do we say, oh, this is going to get him? Oh, this is going to be the thing. And nothing seems to, because, you know why? Because he doesn't stand for anything. And all he does is appease the people who he knows are fanatical about what he's doing. All of this ultra right wing, uh, all the ultra right wing things that he's doing, you know, yeah. and and this Supreme Court and and all of these things are fanatical people who are going to stick with him. Is he doing ultra right wing things, uh, or is he? A man of no politics at all, who's simply playing to what he believes his base wants. That's exactly what I mean. That's that's you said it better than I did. He's he doesn't really stand for anything. He doesn't have much of an ideology. He just goes where he knows he's got a strong base. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and that's why yeah. that's why they support him. Yeah, because it's, you know that. And Phil will tell you it's, and I've said it to him many number of times. It's a means to the the, the ends. You know, we always say the ends don't justify the means. Well, in in uh, in in uh, Trump's case, that's true. The 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 ends are all that matters. How you get there? If you screw somebody, if you if you let the, that now they're calling about the Saudi prince, right? And, right? and everybody's calling it a cover up that that Trump's in a cover up with the prince because of money. Because he, he, well, you know, you know what this is. Can't do that. But what this all is, hello, Brian. Uh, hello. But what this all is, and what it has become, and the problem with it is, is that we don't know, we don't get to see his taxes. We don't get to know what his involvement in, is in various things, and so therefore, we don't know what was his involvement with Russia, what was in his involvement with Saudi Arabia, and then he's making all these deals while he, while he's still running for president. Okay, right. now granted, there's nothing really wrong with that, but there is something wrong with that. You know, it's just something you divest yourself of when you're running. Yes, Jeff. 
the, the first thing that always irritates me about him yeah. is the word deal. The president's never made deals before. They, they had organizations, they had changes, but they never called them deals. He, he turned the thing into a business strategy. Well, I mean, he's got people from Saudi Arabia using his hotel in Washington, D.C. He's basically doing business with foreign governments, which it is against the law for a president to do. But yet we don't know whether he's doing business with them because we don't know his involvement in each of these things and how much money he has and where he's spent his money because, oh, he's well, he's under audit. Well, fuck you. Yes, so you're under audit. We still want to see your taxes. That was an excuse. That was an oh, excuse. Now we're going to find out because the Democratic Congress will get his taxes. Yeah, yeah. They'll get his taxes. All they have to do is subpoena. They have the power of subpoena. Yeah. You know. mm-hmm. So I feel like a little better with him in power and a Democratic Congress because you feel like at least the adults are in the room supervising a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Well, you know something? I think what's really disappointing was that the Republicans got behind Trump, even though they hated him. Right. I mean, they didn't like him. They didn't want him to be the candidate. They didn't want him being president, and they know what he's doing to the office of the presidency, but they feel they all have to get behind him. Power corrupts. And, yeah, and so they and, become and they become um, uh, codependent yeah, on power him. Power corrupts. They don't want to lose their uh, – they're afraid of losing their, their re-election bid, so they have to stick together, and, and they're afraid to come out and do what's right. Where are they all now? Except for the ones – who are the ones that are – there's a bipartisan bill in the Senate right now to uh, to uh, regarding this Prince thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's being done. Uh, the Republicans, what Corker? It's always Corker. It's always Flake. It's always these guys who are retiring. Where are the ones that are sticking around? Where are their balls to do the right thing? Well, all I know is that the, a lot of the people in the Senate and the Congress got they have- debriefed by the CIA and they've heard these tapes. And they've they've seen videos, right? And they, and they all did. they all want to just, you know, stop doing business with the with Saudi Arabia, you know, as and, we would normally do with any other president, right? And um, um, they said, oh well, you know, we have a like a forty two billion dollar deal with the Saudis. No, we don't. We have a forty two billion dollar potential deal with the Saudis, but all they're planning on spending is something like $13 billion. Mm-hmm. You know. But Trump doesn't think that the rest of the world looks at us as sellouts. So you only have morals when it doesn't involve money, huh? There's no, where's your morals? Where's, you know, you're just a sellout. Well, look at who the- he makes excuses for. He makes excuses for Putin. He makes excuses yeah. for the Saudi prince. He, he, he chummies up to uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, and he... Uh, you know, rails against the French president and, you know, all our allies. And Merkel you're going, and everybody. Yeah. Why Why are you doing this, Donald? You know. Even the prime minister of Canada. Yes, exactly. Well, it's just I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what happened, though, is that it's interesting that this wonderful businessman named Donald Trump goes down to Argentina. The minute he's face-to-face with the Chinese, he caves he just caves in on everything he said, all his tough talk. Oh, well, maybe we can make a deal. And, you know, and all the Chinese have agreed to, they didn't make a deal with him. All they've agreed to is they will look at 100 points that the United States has as a grievance against China and take a look at them and see if they can do something about them. But that's all he got out of that. And when he came back for a day or two, the stock market kind of went up going whoop de doo And then they saw that no deal was really made in yeah. Argentina. And it tanked yesterday like I haven't seen. It went down 799 points a day. How much did it go, on to, to, how much did it go down today? Uh, today it wasn't open. It was, closed today for, it was closed today for the Bush. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who knows what it'll do tomorrow? You know, I mean, uh, any any gains we had last week, which was a good week, have been completely eradicated. Well, you know where I stand on that issue. 
Burn the motherfucker to the ground. Burn what motherfucker to the ground? The Dow, the template, every fucking thing. It goes the country if you do that. And I'm supposed to feel bad because... Because you live here? Oh, I live here. It doesn't mean I like it. Just because I live in a house of thank you. Just because I live in a house of horrors doesn't mean I don't want to burn it the fuck down. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Brian, because I have money in the stock market, and I just took a drubbing last week. You're what the military would call a collateral damage. Well, thank you very much. I feel good about that. I don't understand. I don't understand what you think would come out of that. Hopefully, something better. If not, then well, <laughs> say hello to the extinction of the human race. So you know, to me, that kind of thinking is what put Trump in office because people were saying, "Well, what what can happen? Let's just go for it." Well, the kind of I thinking that put Trump in any sense. A part of the tr a part of the thinking that put Trump in office to begin with was the distaste with the elitism that was permeating throughout the country, especially in the Washington, D.C. <laughs> begin with. This is where I have a modicum of empathy for people like my father who voted for the man to begin with. Yeah, I got people who wanted to do away with the elitism in the country by voting in a billionaire. Yeah. <laughs> I know, there's a, there's a contradiction there. That's because, uh, that's because that's because most of the, the motherfucker. because most of the information that you're reading about all this crap is is for, it was coming from social media and all fake bullshit. People like your father and people who voted for Bush voted for not for uh, excuse me for Trump didn't vote for Trump uh, the uh, the uh, the politician they voted for Trump the TV star. Right. That's what they voted for. They voted for that guy that they lit perfectly every week, sitting in that chair, looking like he was taking care of business. That's what got him elected in the minds of a lot of these people, because they're, I, I don't want to say this about your father, but they're morons. Well, it start, I mean, as far as port of origin, I mean, you could say it started with Reagan. You could say it started with Nixon. Uh, in terms of, you know, winning the Southern strategy and playing, you know, culture, politics and, you know, how, how everything just kind of turned in on it, turned in on itself between that and the gutting of the middle class and, uh, you know, us turning into a service based economy and all that other bullshit. But, uh, you know, part of it, it's you weren't 40, really 50, 60 years of this that festered and, 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 and boiled and, and, and whatever that brought us this man. Trump, remember, Trump is the symptom, not the cause. Uh, uh, no, you could also say Trump was the con job. Oh, he's a con. Oh, he's a con artist, but he's also the symptom of everything that's everything that's. I don't know. Well, happening. well, then, then, then we say, then we make an excuse for Hitler that he was a symptom. And Actually, for, yeah, for, I would. It, it really? Okay. Why? Because of the austerity measures of the uh, what? The Reimar Republic, and you know that they were they were canceling uh, unemployment uh, benefits for people in, in, well, uh, no, in the, the uh, country happened, of Germany what happened, prior, because the, of the, the large the big, debt they owed the big, to big via mistake, the Treaty of Versailles. The, yes, I would the, say that the big uh, mistake uh, was, big, was a symptom can of the I problem. Can I talk? Uh, the, um, the 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 problem with uh, with the with Germany was, is that the uh, Allies uh, decided they were going to f fine um, Germany just an extraordinary amount of money that put them into debt, that put them into poverty, and then along comes Hitler saying, "I'll get you out of all this poverty." A demagogue, yes, yeah, yeah, uh, and. Um, but you know, is he is he is he a result of the, is he a symptom of the of the problem? Uh, I, I you know it's at hard. first yeah I could argue you could I would give you this that it, at first he was a symptom and then over time because he lasted Hitler lasted or did 10, he see twelve years did he, did longer he, than Trump did, did he, he see became some, a problem did he, he became see, a bigger and bigger did, problem but to start with he was a symptom yeah. of a previous problem did he that see something transmogrified into something worse did he see something to capitalize on. Yeah. So do you think Trump saw something to capitalize on or do you think he yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I always felt with Trump and his campaign that he was constantly shooting blanks in every direction hoping he'd hit something. Well, from what I understand, he he uh trademarked the Make America Great Again uh baseball cap a day a day or two after uh uh, uh Romney lost to Obama in 2012. That's how shrewd and calculating the motherfucker was. Did he do that, or did his people do that? Like um, either way, Rob. Bannon, it's still, or 
Either way, Rob, it still speaks volumes on how shrewd and calculating these motherfuckers as a whole. Absolutely, but I don't. I won't give Trump that credit. I would give his handlers that. How credit. can he copyright a, a, a term, for instance, that he stole from Ronald Reagan? By having it put placed on a baseball cap and uh, with against a red background with white lettering. That yeah, and, and all like that with what was copyrighted, not the trademark. phrase "Make America Great Again," but the uh, design. Yeah, a trademark or a service mark. Yeah, but there is no TM on those hats. There's nothing to to, to hold the trademark. Well, no, there might as well be. <laughs> no, but there isn't. That's what I'm saying. And you have to, in order to, for instance, I have Gabnet TM. And the reason it's Gabnet TM is at least once on the web page, I have to have it with the TM to hold a trademark. I don't physically have a trademark, but that holds it, keeps it in place. If that were true, my Facebook profile, my Facebook page would be doomed. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it promotes your stuff yeah. and everyone else's, so, hey, hey, it works. Hey, Renee, how are you? I'm good. You know what I'm looking up is I saw that Melania Trump and Donald Trump were putting out new products, like mm. clothing and stuff like that, and I didn't pay much attention to it. So I'm going to look it up and see if they've TM'd all of those as well. Yeah, well, I'm sure. I'm sure if you look at the Donald <laughs> Trump line of whatever, it, uh, there's a TM there. Uh, Donald Trump. Uh, there was a a name for his clothing line of ties and stuff like that. I'm sure it had a trademark. Douche, twenty thousand or two thousand and two. Well, I'm thinking. Uh, I'm thinking <laughs> sack of pig shit, Trump brand or something. You know, that, that could work too. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I mean, um, I just think that the problem we've got here is that there was no, we have not been able to see his holdings and what he, the business he was doing. Uh, and um, if we had a clearer picture of that, we'd have a clearer picture of, of his motivation in just about everything. So they have a Santa hat, a MAGA Santa hat. MAGA Santa hat? Yep. Is it white? It's, well, it's got the white band with the red on the top, and it says, Make America Great Again Santa you have to, hat. It's important that Santa remain white. Oh, yeah. Jesus. So, we're, so we're monetizing the white. We're making like, you know, like like Sean, what, what's his name? Like um, Rush Limbaugh has. Yes. Sean Kennedy. He sells sponges and he sells those chairs he sits in. And so now yep. the president is doing that stuff. Oh, yes. that's well, as I recall, and, and, President Bush was what, what, uh, selling what, what, off what, his plates. Wait, seats that he, that he sits in? What's this? Yeah, you can buy the EIB network. Um, oh, oh. The chair the, he sits the in. The leather he chair? Sells those chairs. Yeah, that you, if you, you could buy his chair. Not his that's chair, disgusting. but one like it. Hmm. Not oh, his man, chair, one like it, though. Hmm. Because the the just the amount of whatever comes out that ass should not be anywhere in my house. Yeah, yeah no, no, not, no. I'm no just wondering. I'm, gonna, I'm wondering if I should buy one and use it here on the program. Gross. Get a big big EIB flag for the mic. Yeah, you know. There you, go. you should pour bleach on it just to fuck with the colors and make That's it your true. own. <laughs> That's yeah. just disgusting. Did you see? Okay, so. You guys know me. I'm not the biggest military person on the planet. I mean, there's a reason for it, and I pay all my taxes. Did you see him not put his hand on over his heart when he was at the funeral? He, he put his hand over his heart. Not Ooh. the photos I've been seeing. You mean Clinton? Or, I mean, who? Oh, no, uh, President Trump. So everybody was oh, had their huh? hands over the heart, but he didn't have his. He had his over his I don't know if, what part he of it. He doesn't have a heart. Oh, well, he had to find it. That. It was taking him time to find it. We could use yeah. that as an excuse. No, he so, whatever. He, he I don't was care. at the at, at the anymore. end of it. He was. Uh, I think when they were passing the coffin was passing them. He had his hand over his heart. I remember. Okay. I'll go back and look. I remember we're that. We're appreciating the death of a war criminal, anyhow. So who fucking cares, anyhow? Well. War Wait criminal. until Bush two I, goes. I, I, I'm gonna let it rip. Yeah, I would. I would argue that with you, Brian. <laughs> That and the fact that he's uh, he's uh, he's written off how many people, how many uh, gay Americans who died of AIDS. So you know what? He can go fuck himself. Uh, that, that was, that, if that, I weren't an atheist, I'd say I'm high hope he's wait, burning wait, 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 along wait, with Reagan, wait, wait, the wait, Union Buster, wait, wait, that, and the King. Boy, you, I can't get a word in edgewise, Brian. 
I don't know if anybody's fast enough, Alex, for that. Yeah, he's I know. good. He he's starts really going, good. and then he doesn't listen to see if anybody else is talking. Yeah. Well, when I'm done talking, then go ahead and talk. Well, <laughs> yeah, but we, I haven't got all night. <laughs> that way I don't forget what the fuck I'm trying to say. Yeah. Wait, you asked if somebody wanted another show. Brian and I will do one. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you want it, that would be an interesting <laughs> pair. If you want it, have at it, you know. I'll just sit back and watch the carnage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, you could do but one. Enjoy it. You could do one, Renee, because, because for you, it's like e just early evening over there. You know. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. You know, you know. It was eighty degrees. The sun's setting right now. It's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. But <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, actually, cold. the weather's been pretty nice here, but it's just been cold. But it's been oh. sunny. In fact, girlfriend who hasn't been able to go out at all uh, looked outside and said. Oh, it looks like it's a very nice day outside. I said, inside, it looks like a nice day outside. I said, outside, it's now 38 degrees. And I looked at my Mickey Mouse uh, Apple Watch here. Uh, I made a joke on Twitter once about this, about HW. You want to hear it? Is it, is it appropriate at this time? Well, well it's Gatnet, so what isn't appropriate? Uh, well... <laughs> I don't know. You know, I'm taking these nice pills. I'm just thinking, uh, you know, the Republicans' version of hell, all right? They're sent to hell and forced to watch by Satan, uh, Elder Bush, Ronnie the Union Buster Reagan, and McCain engaged in three-way gay sex porn. My version of hell, my version of hell <laughs> is basically watching the same thing, only with everyone else involved. <sighs> God, would that be something I didn't want to see? <laughs> well, to begin with, I will give uh, George Bush some credit. He went into that Gulf War, and when it was oh, when the Kuwaitis had been returned to power in Kuwait, uh, he um, he said, "Okay, pull everybody out." And uh, Schwarzkopf and a whole bunch of other guys in the military said, "No, let's go into Iraq now and go get them. We can take that over." And he that. said, no, I made a pledge that this is all as far as we were going to go, that we had a stated mission and we've had a stated mission and now we, we get out. I don't want to see anybody get killed over this. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and very few people got killed in that war, by the way. Americans, I think there were 38 deaths, I think, in the entire war. Uh, and the only problem I had with it was is the Kuwaitis were a bunch of assholes. Uh, and uh, while we were giving up our national treasure and sacrificing some of our human lives for him, for them, they were in Paris at uh, the Ritz Carlton, sitting around living the high life, and said, "Just let us know when we come back to take over our country." They were really. There was a girl that was uh, testifying before Congress, a Kuwaiti girl testifying yeah. before Congress that the Iraqi soldiers came in, uh, the nursery, and was. That was all. That was all, that was all. That uh, was all set up. I was just going to say it was yeah. later to proved by Canadian television, among other outlets, that that was false. And it was so. a, it was a false story made up by us as part of our justification for being in there. Uh, Either way, we were lied into that war, just like we were lied into the Iraq War, too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. They're both illegitimate, well, as far as I'm concerned. Well, well and the common thread of all this is Dick Cheney. So I would like to ask Jeff, what the fuck? All this stuff. You, how many hearts has that man got from us now? Because he's been <laughs> in the military. We paid for five of that man's heart. His hearts. What is wrong? Why doesn't he just go stop it, Jeff? Stop well, listen. I got to tell you product. something. I got to tell you something. I'm glad he's alive, just so I could Dick see Shane? that. No, just so I could see the look on his face when he was looking at Trump today from the row in back of him. Uh. It, it just oh, go back go and watch the then. video of that. And you, Cheney is looking at him like, what fucking motherfucking cocksucker. Really? Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. but Dick Cheney could have him off. I don't get it. <laughs> Seriously, Dick Cheney's nasty. Um, yeah. the heart you should take Trump that... hunting. Yeah, you should <laughs> take Trump hunting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, him and Bolton are from the same cloth, aren't yeah. they? Cheney and Bolton. So, oh, yeah. yeah. The wall, but no, the walrus is in the Jeff. Walrus, I I've like got 4,000 that I've had. Yeah. There's only two of them in there now. But I also had two of them that were taken away. 
Well, you're not doing evil things. Yeah, he's he's. I know of four heart replacements that we've done for that. I don't man. think we've done four for heart replacements for him. I think, that, it, I think there's only I think there's only been one heart replacement for the longest time. He had like a a, a artificial heart in there. Oh, uh, did he? That was pumping away. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So uh, the gentleman who was the heart. Uh, let's see, Doctor uh, Gerard Benson, B E N. Excuse me. B E R E N S O N died at 96. He's the traced heart disease from childhood. So I guess he's a data person and not a mechanical person. What, what, who are you talking about? What is this? What are you talking it's about? It's just a, one of our heart, a, a famous heart doctor died recently. Uh huh. Yeah. Earl Backett. B A K K E N. Anyway. I don't know I why start. you're bringing that up. We're, we're I want Dick Cheney to die, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Just stop making Jeff stop by the, by the way, folks, that good. By the well, way, that'll probably happen when, uh, what's his name, uh, Kissinger dies. By the way, oh. uh, you know, uh, the reason our audience, our, our callers can say this sort of thing, folks, and they wouldn't be able to say it on national Kissinger's broadcasting, not is because, not is because this is a podcast. And uh, the thing we can do on podcasts is say anything we fucking want to, including total and utter lies. Okay. <laughs> now, what? here's the statistic I got today, and it is going to it is going to just absolutely astound you. Okay. Right, we know we know that everybody in America practically has a podcast. Okay. Mm. How many podcasts <laughs> do you think there are on iTunes? Over three million. I was going to say thirty million. Uh, no, no, podcast, podcast. Come on, people are doing what we're doing right now. I'd say thirty to fifty million. I give it a range. How about you, Jeff? Idea? Ten million. How about you, Renee? I miserably am going to sit at three million. <laughs> three million. Well, that's that's high. That's really high. Three million is really high. We're talking about podcasts. Yeah. Renee, people have to get themselves a microphone. They have to be able to record it, know how to do it, all of that. It's not like but, everybody who breathes can say, I, I want a podcast. Huh? I was just thinking there's 330 million people in this country. Mm -hmm. So you got to figure 30 million. That's why, that's why I went with a number like well, that. But the podcast. Because, I because I listen to Pod Save America, and I swear to God those people have at least 100 downloads that I'm just to load and listen to them. So when you ask that question, but you're asking shows, you're not asking episodes within um, the shows. I, I, I'm saying how many podcasts, not individual podcasts, but how right. many podcasts. This is a podcast. In other right. words, well, we do this every night, podcast. so this constitutes right. one podcast. Right. right okay. Right. Are you ready for this? Yeah. 609,000. Really? Just, is that... Is that is that worldwide? Uh, that is yeah, on iTunes. Probably. That's on iTunes alone. ITunes. But I mean, that's so, worldwide. That that's podcasts from yeah, all over the yeah, world. Well, that would yeah, yeah that would uh, everybody who has a podcast Jeez. on Apple six hundred nine thousand. Let me. You're going to have to stop saying everybody's got a podcast now. <laughs> well, it, yeah. it's getting close. I mean, come on. It's getting close. You know, well, everybody's I mean, when, got a blog. Everybody when I when shit. I look at how many people watch this show, which is uh, several many hundreds a night, okay, and I feel depressed with that number. I'm not so depressed now, knowing that there are six hundred nine thousand <laughs> other people doing podcasts while I'm doing mine. I'm actually I'm actually getting very good numbers. Yeah, if you think about it, if there were six hundred thousand radio stations all broadcasting opposite your morning show. Wouldn't be very much in the ratings. No, there. no. You, you, even if I was number one, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, yeah. Nice kitchen, Rob. Oh, thanks. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't stop to think that is your kitchen, isn't it? Let's see. What I do we thought have? it was a picture at first. <laughs> Instead of magazine cover. Article on four <laughs> seven hours ago. Big uh, retirement losses if the market crashes tomorrow. Uh, well, uh, lovely uh, news. Uh, I keep uh, seeing on. I, they're readjusting our. Our income level, and that's why I took money out of the market because they're just readjusting our expectations of what living is going to be like 
in the United States. Yeah, down, exactly. Down. Yeah, well, the thing is, I'm not doing anything because the worst thing you can do is pull out when it's going down. You pull oh, out when you pull out when it's high. <laughs> you know, that's when you pull out. Yep. You don't pull well, out when I it's going did, down. But not enough money. We're going to, I mean, it's been red for almost two weeks now. Oh, it, yeah. It, you know, I, I. We're yeah, into I, our second well, week of I, red. I think it's going to get better. Not as good yeah. as it was, but it's going uh -huh. to get better. The same yeah, shit as what happened in 2008. Everybody, it's not doom and gloom. This country is going to, it's going to rebound. We're going to come back. Don't panic. I don't need that yeah. money for Is several it, years. I don't need to Bear in mind, starting in 2020, the baby boomers are really going to start, including my mother, are going to start retiring in mass. I don't need to, I, including I, I, 2029. I, I, 2030. I don't need to uh, to dip into that money for a couple of years yet. So uh, I'm I figure in a couple of years at least it will go up. If it goes down further, well, so be it. I will be out there, you know, with all the other street urchins. You know. Would you like fries with that? Huh? Yeah. Would you like fries with that? Listen, McDonald's would be some of those fries too. <laughs> you know, they they say they're going to do what? How many thirty thousand jobs or something over at uh, over at uh, Amazon here in New York? Oh, right? Are you going to be there? You, do you think they give me <laughs> at my age? Do you think I got a chance at a fucking job? I'd say what's you wrong, do actually. What's wrong with warehouse? Radio yes. Amazon? What? What's wrong with Radio Amazon? What do you mean, Radio Amazon? What's Radio Amazon? Oh, I don't know. I just invented it. Why can't you Alex, do it? Alex, I, I think you'd be great shoppers in our in our aisle, in our maternity section. We have a great sale on so so da 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 you know. You, you get a job doing that. There's you a, can there be are, the voice. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of the supermarkets have radio, um, like, like different radio. They have their own radio station. Someone's getting paid to do that. <laughs> Well, I, if I do that, how the mighty have fallen. <laughs> yeah, well, it would be really it's better nice. than working. So, Alex, where you work, what radio station are you on now? Oh, I'm on Radio Safeway. <laughs> it's better than being okay. at uh, but serving up. We have, we, ha we, have a, we have a sale today on Pete's Coffee in aisle 10. And by the way, pick up on aisle 7. Would you rather be living up. under a bridge holding your withered cock, or would you rather be standing bet, under a supermarket uh, uh, radio system holding a lot of cash? I'd rather I'd rather be under the bridge with my withered cock. Okay, <laughs> okay so at you, least you're principled. I got to give you that much respect. <laughs> uh, CVS, the job you would want would be CVS because CVS is trying to get into the healthcare market. So if they successfully do that, then you'll be working for a very long time if you were doing CVS stuff. And then um, Amazon, because they're I am about to be for everything. I'm about to be 79 years old. Do you think any of these people would do anything but laugh me out the door if I asked for a job? They can't I don't legally. Understand. They can't not, legally? Not I to your face, Rob. Well, <laughs> not to your face, right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh -huh. However, being the radio vo or being the voice of Amazon or being the voice of C uh, CVS doesn't require anything that you don't already own and you can't already produce for them and just give it to them. That's right. How do you, you become right a how do you become a voice of Amazon? There is no voice of Amazon. Maybe well, there should be. Becca. Yeah, Maybe but there should be. Yeah. Or Alexa, whatever the fuck. Yeah, but then called. they'll hire some fucking movie star to do it. Yeah. yeah, you know where Gwyneth Paltrow has just trashed so many people at this point. I I just don't know. I'm not even listening. What do you mean? Is she does she do commercials? Oh, she's got a new. Gwyneth Paltrow is doing a lifestyle. Oh, oh, you're talking about commercials where she's physically on screen. Oh yeah, she has and her own. She has her own products. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah she yeah. has her own products. Yeah. Yeah, she's yeah, really just some wheelie. Hey, she she's made two hundred and fifty million dollars, a billion, I think, or million I, or something, amazing amount of money off her products. It's disgusting, though. It's so. It's just not. Yeah. Uh huh. And Kim Kardashian, God, she. You know the the Kardashian family just keep raking in the money. And that I don't understand. At least so when I when you pounce on Gwyneth Paltrow, she actually has back. She's got something that she's actually worth. But the Kardashians, what are they worth? What well, is it that they well, they do? are they are a brand and they sell. I mean, she has a new brand called KKW, 
and supposedly it is heading Kimming towards Kanye it's West? it's heading towards a billion. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I don't understand yep. how paying them. Are they doing the Donald Trump thing where they're just lending their name to products? Well, you have to realize that in today's economy, personality is a, is a brand name. It is, right. is a saleable commodity. You know, Trump wasn't building hotels. Trump was slapping his name on hotels. He was selling the naming rights. That's right. You know, uh, uh, and the same thing with the Kardashians. I mean, they don't have to do anything. I mean, uh, the um, was it the youngest daughter who is, a, is now officially a billionaire because she's turned, she's flipped houses. That was her oh. whole deal. Yeah, she's making a somebody, fortune. Isn't somebody a, a, an actual? Uh, she's not top of the line fashion model, but she's a solid. Oh, oh no, uh, uh, the, she is a top of the line fashion model. You're talking about the well, wh wh which one? Uh, I, I th don't know. There, there's I know Ken, it's one Ken, of them. Ken, Ken, Kendall, I think. Yeah, Kendall uh, Jenner. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, she is. Um, she she's got is something. She is a major, major, major model. She's okay. like the model for any number of different products. And she went into that modeling thing on her own, you know, and just uh, earned it fair and square. Yeah, that I would give her. She's the only one that I, I like. And then freaking that Bruce, excuse me, Kendall Jenner. What is her name? Uh, you mean uh, 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 the, yes. the father? Yes. But yeah. He, and he turned he she turned against Trump and I was like no bitch no 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 don't even try to talk for uh, for gay people gay people and transvestites don't want to hear this stuff coming out well transsexual trans uh, transgender do not come under the category of of gay of, of homosexual yeah, but they're in the big umbrella. Well, they, they're, 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 part, they're part of the, you know, G, BLG, BLT, BLT, uh, FFJ, QMI, QIA, yeah, yeah. NSP, WXYZ. Uh, they they yeah. fall in that category, but the fact is I, that I transsexuals so. many times are quite heterosexual. So uh, transgenders are, are quite heterosexual. Uh, she still doesn't get a pass. She voted for Trump. She stomped for Trump. And now she's like, oh, my it's, God, he's in trying fact, to take I, something I, away I, from us. I, I keep oh, the, I, Renee, you're talking about South Park's buckle up, buckaroos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, but but I but uh, I um, you know I like to tell the story that I knew uh, all the transgenders who were named in uh, uh, Lou Reed's Walk on the Wild Side. Really? Yeah, I knew every one of them, and uh, they each one of them represented a different kind of transgender. You know, one was uh, Candy Darling, who was very much female. I mean, Candy would come into the room I would kiss her hello and uh, uh, you know she, she deserved your respect because she really presented herself very in a very lovely way as a woman then you had Holly Woodlawn who was kind of a cartoon character of a woman uh, and um, and then you had uh, Jackie Curtis and Jackie Curtis would come in wearing a dress with a two-day growth of beard okay <laughs> so I mean they were different types they were different types and yeah. um, Holly, I know for a fact, got more, can I use the term, pussy than any guy I ever knew. You know, and here he is, the guy in a dress. That's yeah. an interesting so, one. The ones I've known are not into women. Really? I've known a couple, and my wife, you know, she lives from the Philippines, and she introduced me to a good friend of hers, her family's, who, when I first saw her, there was no way in God's name I would have ever thought was a man. But she was this really pretty girl, and it carries herself like a girl. And the ones I've known are very female-centric. You would never know unless, unless you uh, had a, an encounter with them that they, or if they told you that they were that they were men. You know, well, their penises. It's I went, just amazing. I went and covered a transgender. Um, uh, contest in which these women would come, these guys would come out dressed as women, and um, 
and dance and kind of act provocatively and so on. They didn't strip because if they stripped, you'd see they didn't have the goods, right? Uh, and I videotape, I'm videotaping them. And of course, everything I see is through the viewfinder. You know, you don't really see through your own two eyes. And all of a sudden, into my viewfinder comes the most gorgeous looking, sexiest looking woman you've ever seen. And I videotaped this woman, and we ran her as part of him as part of a segment of Midnight Blue, and eventually I used that image as an image for one, for the bumper card on Midnight Blue because the person looked so sexy and so hot, and guys would look at this woman dancing and go, "Boy, uh, that that woman's giving me a hard on," and I'd go, "Guess what?" <laughs> <laughs> And they, all of a sudden, they'd start feeling guilty about themselves. And I said, don't feel guilty. You think it's a woman. He made you hot. That's all that matters. You were responding well, to what you saw. You know, you're not, it doesn't make you gay. It's like when you're walking down the street and you see this person with beautiful, long, blonde hair and a really nice ass. And you go, wow, that's hot. And then as you pass them, you find out it's a guy. You shouldn't feel guilty about that because the thing that you responded to was what you initially thought it was, you know. Back in 1980, my I had gone. I, I just came back from Florida. I was away working in radio, moved back to New York, and come to find that my brother has a friend who he met at work, and his friend used to tell him a friend and and. Uh, and his brother-in-law, the two guys, mm -hmm. used to talk to my brother all the time at lunch saying, oh, man, we partied last night. We met these really hot girls and we had a blast, blah, blah, blah. Well, it, come to know after a while, because my brother would say, I'd love to go with you guys. I'd love to go. And they kept not letting him go. Mm -hmm. Basically, the end of the story was after after my brother getting a complex, almost thinking they just don't want to hang around with him. They finally were comfortable okay. enough to tell him. <laughs> no, they were comfortable enough to say to him. Well, we got we have something to tell you. We're both gay, and we're both going to gay bars in the city, and so that's why we haven't invited you. So he became really good friends with them. Both of them were married, and they were both they were brother in law, and 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 uh, they were brother in laws, and they had a relationship together, and they were married and had kids. And one night, or a couple of nights actually. Uh, after I met him, they invited us to go to this gay club in the city. Now, this is 1980, so this is before all this. Yeah. Everybody's so comfortable with this thing, right? But I was like, what the hell? We'd heard so many stories. Let's go check it out. So we went to this bar this night, walked into this place, and it was, I mean, I, the women in this place, I was like, was so these gays and lesbians, right? These women are awesome. I mean, like, oh my God, your tongue falling out of your mouth. And my this guy, his guy's name was Humphrey. He tapped me and he says to me, you could put your tongue, ba tongue back into your mouth. There are no women in this place. Wow. See? Yeah. <laughs> went, yeah. Really? Because there's not a woman in here. <laughs> this is down I in the village. Uh, yeah, as yeah. a woman, it's just not fair when, when you see a guy who does his makeup vastly superior to yours. <laughs> it's just not fair. <laughs> it's crazy. It's yeah. Crazy. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, uh, I've said it before for a number of years now that um, men all across the, the entirety of the male subspecies of humanity have a greater capacity to deceive and to masquerade, have more of a capacity to masquerade as, 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 as women than women do as men. I, you know what I think it is? Uh, some of the. I, I've never had a, a relationship with a, with a transsexual, but I, my experience not. with them, my experiences with them, being with them, are they're more feminine than the women because I think they covet it more. They want it so bad that Maybe. they they come across so. I mean, like you forget you're talking well, to guys. I, the I, way I, they speak, I, the I, way they talk. The, I think that you've met a certain kind, but all I'm saying, having met the full spectrum and that those three women or men that I mentioned, uh, Holly Woodlawn, Candy Darling, and, and Jackie Curtis, there was a different approach to each one. It was as though Holly was almost making fun of women. She was playing a cart. It was a cartoon <laughs> character. 
you know, the lips were overdone and so on. Whereas uh, candy, okay. candy was very feminine. And I always got the feeling from Holly that Holly really maybe hated his mother, you know, and that this was his way of getting even by doing this broad caricature. Now, I could never figure out where Jackie Curtis was coming from because why you get dressed up in a dress and he was a pretty good looking guy and wear your hair long and then let your five day growth grow out. I, I, that one I didn't understand. That one I could never, I could never kind of, I, I didn't get the motivation in that one. There's also a difference between female impersonators, like, you know, those who go to shows and they're not, they don't, they, they don't identify as women, but they dress up with the overdone makeup and, you know, all that. Like Divine, the actress Divine, actor Divine. Mm -hmm. Right. He w he wasn't a transsexual. He was just a mm -hmm. female impersonator. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, transvestite, was, I believe, is well, what they're calling it. It, it was, it's that or is it a female? Well, impersonator? They used to call they used to call it I cross it was, cross dressers. Now they're kind of calling it transgender. Uh, I, it changes. I, you know, it I use I used to use the term uh, uh, trans. Uh, um, there's also non-binary used as a word. Used yeah, as a cross dresser was always a term being used, um, uh, but uh, transvestite. Is, you know. Yeah, transvestite. But it's Caitlyn Jenner. Caitlyn Jenner. Yeah. Buckle up, buckle I mean, Caitlyn right now is dating a woman. You know. It's just a traitor. So what does that mean? What 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 is the sexuality then? That's the weird thing about it. Is she is she well, gay? Well, I don't think that being transgender is necessarily a form of sexuality. Well, what, no, but I understand that. But what I'm saying is, so she identifies as a woman, and if she's interested in other women, then is she a lesbian, or at least bisexual? Well, I mean, you know I, what I'm saying? It's, okay, uh, I I knew a a, a transsexual. Uh, and I'm trying to remember her name now. She was a guest on my show. She was a woman, a man, who went and had her dick cut off, okay, and became a woman, okay, so that she could then date women. Huh? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, so she could then date women. I said, so does that make you a lesbian? Or does that make you a heterosexual man? And aren't you going a little out of your way to get laid by doing that? I think our friend yeah. Mr. O'Fano needs about a 10-pound uh, uh, Advil or, or, yeah. <laughs> or aspirin because his head was about to explode there for a minute. Well, I mean, it was it was a, it, it, always a strange thing to me. And I always gave uh, her a Just bad, roll with it, Rob. Kind, Just, kind of a bad time yeah, about, you know, did you do that to get laid? I mean, uh, it, it, it just seems to me, why didn't you just keep the dick on and go out with the women? Yeah. yeah why are you? Kidding. Why did you have your dick cut off, become a woman, so that you could then be a lesbian and go what, after what, women? Yeah, because, I mean, I, once you cut that off, you're not going to have the feeling anymore that you had when you had it. Right. right? So and you're not going to have the true sensation a woman would have. Well, now they can grow a new one back for you. Ooh, they who can't? said that? I did. They can't. <laughs> can they, they really? No, they can't. I, I thought they could. No. I mean, it's expensive as fuck. I they, have read a lot not. of stuff in my time on this subject matter, uh, uh, Brian, and I've never read anywhere where it grows back. Not now. Nah, no, I'm no, they, talking about if it's uh, like through medical. It's not like a root. <laughs> he was, Externally, on like the back of a mouse or some shit, they can grow. Yeah, one. like an ear on the back of a mouse. Mouse. So they could, so they could, do, so that's what, what do they call that? That's, um, uh, addictomatomy? Addictomy. Addictomy. Yeah. <laughs> it's called an addictomy. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but Jeff's that's, like, that's, that's cloning. Out yeah, exactly. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Yeah. Yes. You're Je cloning Je the penis. Jeff has a comment. You got to open your mic. You got to open your mic. Your mic is muted. Your mic. Yeah. Uh, there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I have a cousin of my wife, and uh, she's uh, be becoming a man. 
and she's already pretty much she has a different name and things like that but she's she's like 18 years old okay and who is who who is this well it's a it's a cousin of my wife okay, okay. all right okay you know but yeah and she, but she's a teenager and uh you know that's got to be such a difficult life to build in Absolutely. i guess and uh, yeah it depends she wants to go to college and and, and who are you going to sleep with at the you know usually in college they split your your room with you know i got to tell you though jeff that today these things are being understood more by younger groups of people than by you or i even i agree and, and, and i and i think i understand it you know uh, uh, I, I can't imagine the pain that people have gone through in the past knowing that they had this, and I hate to call it a condition, I think people would mind me calling it a condition, but it, it, it is a medical condition, uh, uh, and, and uh, have had to keep it a secret. Uh, Je uh, 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 Caitlyn Jenner is an example of that, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, all his life uh, had to be the man's man, as it were, and yet felt this compulsion that he felt the woman in him. I don't know if his compulsion, though, was as much about being a woman or dressing as a woman. I don't know. I never could find that, figure out what his motivation was. I know some people physically feel that they're a woman. Yes. I don't know if that's the case with Caitlyn Jenner. As I've watched all these documentaries on Caitlyn and the, the Kardashians and him going through this whole thing. I never really saw that, yeah, what can we call it, hormonal component in, in his situation. He just mm. liked dressing up as a woman. Yeah, but why not just dress as a woman then? Why would you go through all the hormones and put your body through that yeah. if it was just for the clothing? Well, he's not going for the, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, penis removal. You know, he's not going all the way with it. As but a matter breasts, of fact, right? as a matter of fact, what's interesting, let's yes. take one the, that's the other way, which is Chastity Bono. Yeah. Uh, yeah. who of course was a, a woman who who yeah. dresses as a man but has yet to have any kind of operation. To turn her. Yes, she did. No, yes, she, she did. did. No, she didn't. She did. No. Uh, she yes, did. she did. She did. Look it up. You'll see. She I didn't. saw. I saw a whole. I saw a whole documentary on it, and Cher was on it. Uh, she had the full, complete well, meal yeah. deal. Wait a minute. <laughs> a meal deal. You know, I, also, I'd like to say that Cher did a stupendous <laughs> job with her with they both did a really good job with her with their children so and I, the way she stood behind chastity through all of this i thought that was a, an excellent well, she example. didn't in the beginning she didn't in the beginning she was um because chastity talked about it in the documentary i don't even know where i saw that it might have been on own or you know oprah's network whatever i'm not sure where i saw it but she her mother didn't really take to the idea immediately she grew into it but it took okay. a while it says Not in mid to uh, two to pivot on a turn yeah no i mean uh, she she's she's definitely behind her now but yeah uh she in the beginning it was uh it was uh it was touch and go they had their moments well was sunny more acceptant of it than than Cher was is that the issue according to this according to this <laughs> wikipedia <laughs> on chastity there is no sign of chastity having a uh, an operation to change. Oh, you, did you say Wikipedia there, Alex? Yeah. <laughs> because you, you'll discount my notion that the that the theory of uh, you know syphilis. Yeah, exactly. You, yeah, cherry picking motherfucker that no, you are. No, 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 I'm not a cherry picking motherfucker. Yeah. I've looked. Well, at, yes, you are. I've looked and I, seen. I, you're you were wrong, wrong, wrong. They're okay? both valid. Theories. No, that's they not. No, no. Just because something's a theory doesn't make it valid. What are we talking about? A cherry, cherry picking motherfucker. No, I'm not a cherry picking motherfucker. <laughs> so I would like to say that I'm a cotton picking it. motherfucker, but not a cherry picking. I'm so amazed you get all those people in the song. I would like the method. So according to according oh, by to the way, I, Alex, here's your return on investment. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> according to what I'm reading here, here let me just pull down my. 
Well, Chaz Bono bega uh, began undergoing a physical and social transition from female to male. Yes, the this was confirmed June 2009 yes, by his but, publicist. But the physical was not the surgery. The physical were the, was the uh, hormonal. I believe I remember from the TV special I saw. Bono's no, legal transition. I remember seeing an interview with him, with, with him and him being asked, are you going to do the thing where you're going to, you know, literally uh, add a penis to yourself? And he said, I don't know if I'm ready for that because I, I, I've made the commitment towards being a man. I feel I'm a man, uh, but that may be just too much for me to deal with. And that, that's what I saw in an interview during that period of time. There is no record. Chaz Bono, there's in Rolling Stone magazine, Chaz Bono, I'm saving to buy a penis. Oh. Yeah, I'm saying we buy a PlayStation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you both have something to play with in six months. Won't you? you can have mine. It's for sale. You know what? Well, you're, no, but Tony's quite right. You can play with either of them. You're not using yeah, it. Yeah, I got, got the new Spider-Man box in, Alex. I'm going to open that shit off. <laughs> <laughs> That was perfect time. But I don't think, I don't think. You are correct. I, I, now I remember she went in for an operation. It was to remove her breasts. Yes. That she, she got her do. breasts. She got her breasts removed. That is correct. Now I remember it. I don't, uh, I knew there was something she got done. Yeah. But yeah. she had them taken away. Yeah. Now, uh, but. safe. Uh, you know, I mean, I, yes, it was wonderful the way Cher handled it. Uh, she even she, though Cher admitted that at the very beginning she wasn't handling it well, that it was affecting her, and then you know she's a mother, you know, and eventually you kind of come around and say, hey, you know, I love my kid. Now what can I do to make that kid feel better about this? So. You know, they're still doing that horrible therapy. What therapy is uh, that? Yeah, conversion therapy. Oh my. God. Well, you know, in is some that... states it's illegal. Not in Indiana, home of Pussy Pence. Right. Jeez Louise. Yeah. Well, as that we all know, that uh, I've often said to my gay friends, how do you feel that what you're doing is an abomination in the eyes of the <laughs> Lord? <laughs> and, Who's, well, some of the <laughs> church, some of the church going uh, homosexuals would say, which version of God? I would say back to them, which version of God do you believe in? Because there are there are. Christian homosexuals, and one of a few of whom I'm friends with on Facebook, and I just want to ask them, which version of God do you believe in? Yeah. Uh, your version of God or Pat Buchanan's version of God? You know, you know bottom line, God's a fucking hook. So, well, uh, the the, the, uh, the um, uh, I, you know, I um, what was what was the point I was going to make? Uh, I forgot now. Who's God? There, there uh, oh, are we going to get into that? <laughs> I vote for she's. Uh, what was that song? What if God was one of us, just a clown like the rest of us on the. Oh, that's the song. Yeah. 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 <laughs> if I believed in God, I would believe in that notion that he's a fuck he or she or it's in a fact, fucking. She, she sang that song us. live on my show in San Francisco. Uh, what was her name Boy. though? I can try to remember her name now. Uh, is that the cranberries? No. No. No, no. no. Oh, and she no. died really young, didn't she? Did she die? The yeah. lead singer really? of cranberries? Not too long ago. Yeah. She was like super well, like, it was like eight in, months ago, wasn't it? Yeah. She was like less than thirty five died or oh. right at thirty five or something like that. She was young. Uh, let's, let's see. see. Lead singer of cranberry. Let's see. <laughs> what was her name? I don't know. No, but I know, I know the song. It wasn't Atlanta Morissette. It was Joan Osborne. Joan Osborne is who I'm thinking of. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah. January 15th of 2018. Yeah. Died accidental. What? Was it a drug overdose? No, I don't know. That was a weird one. So, and that was another thing I was going to say. Is anybody else having search issues? Because I'm asking them to go search things, and it isn't coming back with with what I was looking for. Is anybody else having search engine problems? I never, I, you know what I found is the most accurate thing I can use lately, and I should have done it tonight. Uh, 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 
let me give you an example. Echo, who sang uh, What If God Was One of Us? Here's what I found on Wikipedia. One of Us is a song written by Eric Bazilian and originally released by Joan Osborne. Hey? Oh, oh, she got it. Damn. I find that that was... I tried to get you on uh, Amazon. That was, Amazon. It was the best. And I, I, I've asked the questions like, what was the second music, uh, the second film that Steven Spielberg directed? And I didn't ask the first, or I could ask the third, and she, it would come up with it. Wow. And Boy, I, we're going to get spoiled with that. It's much better. <laughs> it's much better than Siri. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, because it's e Google. Echo, what was the second oh, film directed Google. by Steven Spielberg? Is that close? Fighter Squad. What? Mm -hmm. Flyer's Clog? Uh, <laughs> Echo, what was the third movie directed by Steven Spielberg? Escape to Nowhere. Escape to Nowhere? I never heard of that one. I never heard of that. That wasn't the Kurt Russell. No, that was Escape Out of Chinatown. That, that was, or something that was like that. Escape to New York. That one. That, New that, York. That's yes. not Spielberg. <laughs> that was a B movie, really. Yeah. Donald did you see where did you see where uh, where where Spielberg is, is Isaac Hayes. Is Spielberg is re releasing on its twenty fifth anniversary Schindler's list? Really? I saw Something. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, Maybe it should be. Yeah. I don't think these people understand how that all went down. Well, then there was the pornographic parody featured on an episode of Married with Children called Schindler's Lust. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh the the fact is that uh that you know that uh, for years I was getting like uh, uh junk mail from Jewish philanthropies, and I don't know how I ever got on the list, but every I would get like twenty pieces of mail a year from Jewish philanthropies, and I said, what happened? Did I get on Schindler's mailing list <laughs> <laughs> and th you made a good joke out of. Out Not of that, but no, I couldn't figure out. They, and I was probably ready to write these Jewish philanthropies and say, "You really should stop because you spent more money sending me mail than I would ever give you." You know, isn't but, uh, didn't didn't Seinfeld do an episode around Schindler's List? Oh yeah, because, Jerry fell no, it was it was where they were making out with his girlfriend. He was making out with his girlfriend the during the Schindler's the List in a theater, <laughs> and people saw him do it. You know. Yeah, that's right. Uh, make an hour. Yeah. How could you I make out? Wasn't it because his he had no privacy because his parents were staying over his house? I think so. So yeah. they went to the movies <laughs> and they were watching those lists and they were making out. <laughs> Why is it, you know it's funny about about uh, uh, Seinfeld that there are episodes that we keep referring to as things to as examples of stuff i mean yeah. it was so rich with these life lessons could we call them you know and and so you mentioned you know what was the episode where he went to schindler's list and made out with his girlfriend we remember that alex you know what i think of when you tell the story of moby dick i think when jerry is the uh with the moil comes over oh the moil <laughs> the, 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 mo the moil with the shakes yeah with the shakes you with the shakes, they push you. Oh my God. A moil, by the way, in case people are listening and don't know what we're talking about, a moil is a, uh, a does a circumcision. He's a religious uh, guy. Does a it's circumcision. the guy with a knife that's near a child's penis. Yes. But that sounds not good. Well, I don't know. <laughs> if, if, if you want your dick to look like a mole, okay. You know, I mean. I, I, I was very happy with mine. You know, I mean, I don't remember it. Thank God. You know, That'd be traumatic. But I do remember David well, Feldman having me read aloud from Moby Dick when his son had to, had it at their house. You know. But, uh, that was pretty fun. Yeah. Well, I mean, not fun. And they get the kid drunk with wine, too. They get a baby uh, drunk. Give another shot. Yeah. How, how much alcohol does it take for that baby not to feel people removing their body parts? Well, you know, anesthesia? at that point in your life, I don't think... You have a heavy sense of pain, you know. That's not what I've heard. They yeah, really? they have quite a lot of nerve endings there in the foreskin, and uh, that some of the babies get. To, so what I just recently read about that because there's a whole thing now, saying that it's actual mutilation, mutilation, and um, we're missing out right. on about eighty percent of, of of feeling from people who do have their foreskin. Well, I've had really? a lot of, I've had enough feeling yeah. down there to get me in trouble. 
you know. Well, all of us have. <laughs> a lot. That's what I know. That's what they say. It's uh, wait until you're 18 until you after the age of consent, and then decide if you want to have uh, well, your. Oh, no, uh, you don't want to. You do don't want to do it a, then. I know. I had I, an I, uncle who had it done yep. because he he got an infection or something. He was like 50 years old. Boy, did he suffer. Well, then most then most will elect not to have it done, but they shouldn't have it done when they're before they're uh, able to think for themselves. I do think it's a form of mutilation. Let's just, just say as I think it's a woman's right to choose to have a baby or not. Well, it's a man's there, there, right there is to a, there, choose there, if they there, want to have their there, foreskin There's or not. always been a very violent argument over this as to whether it's a health thing or not. And uh, some people believe, well, to begin with, in the Jewish religion, it is it is a Jewish right. Yeah. Okay. okay. No, it is. So I know it is. It's just religion in general is bullshit. All religions. Well, it, it, that's, it, it, but, it, but I'm telling you why it exists. I know okay. you are. I'm just you know I'm spouting off whenever. I but see, bef before when it first started, it was due to cleanliness. Like a lot of the rules that Jewish people have oh, in regards to the food kosher, and stuff. the kosher laws are all yes. because if you do, if violate the kosher Health. laws, you die from eating. You know, yeah. but those but those rules are all antiquated and are not. Yes, uh, but, like they, but, but they've been codified yeah. as religious iconography. Okay. Okay, so. but isn't it? Boy, did I surgery? use some good words there, didn't I? Anyway, mm -hmm. what? Yeah. Isn't it plastic? Why don't you consider it plastic surgery? And if you're going to have plastic <laughs> surgery, you need to wait until you're an adult. To I got to so. tell you, kiddo, this ain't like a nose job. <laughs> 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 well, people who want to have their penises removed because they want to undergo gender transformation, that can't, if that, that's that got to hurt more than having the tip of your penis well, off. Well, it's simply extreme circumcision, uh, you know. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of arguments about circumcision and whether it's... Uh, and it's because we don't know that we as a society as a whole should largely leave this shit up to the individual to decide when they are well, of adult or uh, consenting if, age. If, if it's a Jewish Jeez. child, he's going to get circumcised. It's part of the religion. Yeah, most 80%. Americans do. Yeah, most uh, Americans do. Eighty percent is a really high number. That's right. For what? Because for, it should be something down. That, I mean, it should be that you lose a, like eighty percent of the feeling during sex oh, without your uh, foreskin. You know what we don't have statistics on is the amount of people being circumcised at birth today, as opposed to say twenty years ago. It, is it different? Is it uh, you know? It, has it changed? Because a lot of people have argued whether circumcision is necessary, and it probably is not medically necessary. You know. And, you know, and it's so rare in this country that a lot of people, there's a stigma about the difference in the way it looks. There's also a smegma. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a difference in the way it looks, and there are people. I'll never look at a grilled cheese sandwich the same way again. <laughs> Don't do that. Wait, what were you saying, Rob? <laughs> There's, there's a stigma in the look of it, right? The, and, and it's, so it sets a, when kids go to school and they're in the gym class. And, they won't give a shit. And, and, and they see the uncircumcised penis is a, and it looks different than everybody else's. And that's a reason why a lot of people do it. It's just yeah. because at some point in time there's going to be a question about it? Yeah. And, you know, I remember back in the day, you know, don't I you had guys discussions. <laughs> well, there are, as women, there are women who don't like it. Well, I was just going to say, <laughs> you guys are discussing this and we're like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how does it? Uh, well, the question is, how does Jim, a, go ahead and discuss you on? How does a woman look at it? You know, I we, mean, mo oh man, you should. Sarah Silverman, I think it was Sarah Silverman, went out on stage and did an an entire rant on how bad it looks, how much <laughs> we don't want to be anywhere near it, and get that thing away from me. And she did like 25 minutes on the guy's dick. Well, here's another like, question, Renee. Wait a minute. Here's another yeah. question, Renee. How do, how do women comparatively look at it in relation to modifications they make to themselves? Comparative you know, comparative. if Sarah Silverman were in your place, I'd ask her that to her face. Here, make a joke about that, bitch. Let's see how, let's see how you turn that phrase around. Well, she wasn't saying she didn't like dick. She was just saying... She said she doesn't oh, like it's uncircumcised. Well, it's, it's, my statement still stands. Turn that or to Sarah Silverman, not to you, Renee, out of respect. <laughs> okay. But Sarah Silverman, turn that phrase around, bitch. How do you compare it comparatively to what, you you know, all the optional shit you can do to your body, your breasts? Oh, I've seen Sarah Silverman, True. and she doesn't need to do much optional stuff to her body. Right. 
Whatever. But nevertheless, <laughs> you see yes. my point, though. Bree, hello. Yeah. Good morning, Bree. You're calling at the morning. last minute. Did something uh, um, tickle your fancy? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, just, no, just in general, I, w I was going to say that, uh, you know, when you talk about uh, transgenders, it, for someone who had lived in Southeast Asia, uh, it's very common. Right. Uh, I mean, I know I have acquaintances who are, you know, lady boys and uh, she males, uh, transgender, whatever. Are there so I always ask them what term too. they like. To, you know, what you have to sort of figure that out first. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just common. I don't consider it odd or strange or different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, uh, I think. I just don't care. We probably find it odder in this country than they do in a lot of it. The acceptance of this sort of thing is is much better in other countries, although there's some countries where it's much worse. Yeah, you know. did, Iran. Did, did you know that there is a transgendered yeah. minister in Pakistan? Really? I did not. Pakistan? Hmm. No. Yeah. How is he still alive? Yeah, thank you. They are still alive. No, no, he just... He, he, I. That would be a tough place to be. That now there's somebody with conviction. Well, you know, we don't know. I mean, I would have to ask somebody how the Muslim religion looks upon that sort of thing. Oh, I'm not sure they like it. Well, well it depends on the individual. I mean, you know, and Muslims in general, does do they stand with it, against it, or are, are they against homosexuality, or are they just against sexuality? Under Beats certain me. circumstances. Passes there we go. There we go. Rights. Wow. Excellent. Good for them. Yeah. Oh, and that was this year, 2018. So my That's question wonderful. is, in the Muslim religion, is there a is there room for that? Only this country yeah. is going backwards. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can say that. Them. Oh, Alex, I'll tell you a funny story from last night. I don't know why this happens. I was I was coming home from a grocery store. And this guy rolls down his window, and he tries to start a conversation with me. He wants to shake my hand, et cetera. He says he's from Saudi Arabia. And I had this happen one time before, and I couldn't figure out why. Like, I stopped because I figure uh, they might be lost and need directions. Or, you know, maybe I, I think they were trying to say something about their car needing repairs. It might have been like a money. I'm not sure. But uh, one of the things he said early on was, you're Christian, I'm Muslim, and, and I come to you for help. And I, I looked at him, I said, well, what makes you think I'm Christian? Like, I haven't uh, told you <laughs> this, you know. I kind of think that's a little presumptuous of you. I could be Buddhist, you know, uh, or whatnot. And that really threw him off. This idea that I could be something other than Christian really, I mean, he just sat there for a good long while wondering about that <laughs> you know and uh and because he assumed that the way he was dressed and that he was from saudi arabia then therefore he must be muslim and i must i must acknowledge that and i always have a problem when people make these uh you know assumptions in advance of other people i don't i'm not really into that yeah but when i'm traveling in the middle east i get a, a lot of that you know, I'm I'm Muslim. You're Christian. We know we're not supposed to like each other. And I'm like, oh, that's, yeah, no, you know, no, wait, that's wait not really how it works. That's really quite wrong. <laughs> you're kind of, you seem like a nice wait guy. Wait because I'm, in Muslim <laughs> in Muslim countries, for instance, they accept Jews, and one of the reasons they accept Jews is because they believe in the same one God. In other words, the, the, the thing they don't like are religions that don't believe in one God, like Buddhists who believe in many gods. Uh, and uh, you could argue Hinduism. that Christians believe in three gods, uh, the Son, the Father, and the Holy Ghost. So, you know, but with Jews, Jews actually uh, in Iran, there are synagogues, you know, and they're allowed to, you know, just as long as you don't try to change somebody. Anyway, hey, listen, we're running, you hear the music? You hear that? Is Jack on tonight? Yes, he's on tonight. Yeah, he just had a little problem with his technology last night. Uh, Again, yeah, TMI. TMI. Too much personal information. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I want to thank you, Rob, for being Just, with us tonight. Really cool. appreciate it. Good contribution tonight. Same with you, Brian. Thing, same with you, Anthony. Jeff, always great to have you on. Uh, Renee, uh, lovely to have you from Hawaii. And transposed against the frame next to you as our audience sees it, 
from Bree from Dubai. So we got Hawaii, Dubai, Pittsburgh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and a lot of other places, Bye, bitches. too. Anyway, <laughs> hey, 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 bitches, wave goodbye. Well, yeah, that's our, uh, that's our citizen panel for tonight, uh, international citizens panel, coming to you from everywhere. Well, listen, we're out of here tonight. Let me just turn off the, uh, the uh, uh, Skype lines so that um, our, uh, our uh, next show, which is The Intersection with Jack Bishop, can come on here and do their thing uh he'll do his thing and there is no connections anymore so uh after one o'clock this morning it's uh all these programs rerun endlessly in the meantime i'm alex bennett tomorrow night damian chaplin will be here at 9:30. i'll be here at 10 o'clock same time same station in life and in the meantime as always if you see her don't knock the crutch out from under her and tell her i love her okay bye bye